Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. My name is Earl Bellinger. Very happy to be joining you today. Um, as Avi mentioned, I started last month as an assistant professor at Yale, normally working on astroseismology. Um, and I'm very happy to meet you all and looking forward to collaborating with some of you on a diverse range of topics. So let's jump right in. The dark matter problem has become serious. Observations have indicated that 84% of the mass in the Milky Way is invisible. Yet despite nearly a century of research, no compelling solution for the origin or nature of this matter uh, has emerged. About 0.1% of the dark matter 
are, comes from stars, ma generations of massive stars that have ended their lives and produced a population of about 100 million stellar mass black holes in the Milky Way. An additional 10,000th of a percent comes from the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, and some vanishingly small fraction comes from neutrinos. The remaining 99.9% .9 of the dark matter is hiding in disguises no one knows. One solution to the dark matter problem, as Avi mentioned, goes back to Stephen Hawking, who in 1971 suggested that fluctuations in the early universe could result in the, the collapse of, uh, of objects um, spanning an enormous range of mass. These could be supermassive all the way down to asteroid mass primordial black holes. It's worth pointing out here that this line of thinking is what led Stephen Hawking to probably his greatest scientific contribution, the idea that black holes radiate and eventually evaporate. In the same paper, he speculated that perhaps um, such an object could find its way into the center of the sun, and accretion onto this primordial black hole would supply some of the solar luminosity. And he suggested this as a candidate solution to the, at that point, unsolved solar neutrino problem, which we now know has another solution. Um, uh, but these primordial black holes remain a popular dark matter candidate. Um, as reviewed, for instance, by um, Hawking's former PhD student, Bernard Carr, in this recent uh, review article, pointing out that um, asteroid mass black holes uh, could still supply the entirety of the dark matter, um, although natural formation mechanisms would give you a very broad initial mass function of primordial black holes. Um, and many cosmologists think that even if primordial black holes don't supply all of the dark matter, the Big Bang may have still produced them in perhaps smaller numbers. Interest in this topic has been exploding over the last few years, and now we're at a rate of something like 250 papers per year on primordial black holes. And they're an attractive candidate to the dark matter problem because they don't require us to change any of the known laws of particle physics. So what kind of masses are we talking about here? Well, I'm going to give this presentation in solar masses, and this spans about 20 orders of magnitude. So here's a little schematic I put together just to get you acquainted with it. So the, the Hawking evaporation limit, which may or may not actually exist, you can see the archive today for some speculations on that, um, is down here at about 10 to the negative 18 solar masses. And so um, by the time the solar system formed, all of these black holes would have evaporated. Um, leaving uh, more massive objects that could be the um, uh, primordial black holes with th those, those masses. Stuff like 67P, humanity landed uh, uh, a spacecraft on that. Uh, moon of Saturn, like Hyperion. Um, planet Mercury, yeah, and, and it goes on and on. So uh, Hyperion is a good reference point at 10 to the minus 12 solar masses. So. If we imagine for a moment that we are living in a universe in which asteroid mass black holes supply the dark matter, then we are absolutely inundated in a sea of these primordial black holes. There would be something like 10 to the power 30 of these objects in the Milky Way, and they'd be separated at an average distance of about a parsec. So they're far more numerous and far more densely spaced than stars are. They'd also be whipping around the galaxy with some enormous velocity, maybe on average about 220 uh, kilometers per, per second, which means if they encounter a star, they would just pass through it like a bullet. Um, the odds of a star, a fully formed star, capturing such a black hole is exceedingly low. But during star formation, you can do some calculations on the time varying gravitational potential of a giant molecular cloud, and you find that a one solar mass star has a non negligible chance of capturing. Um, uh, such an object, such that there would be something like 10,000 stars, solar mass stars in our Milky Way that have a primordial black hole at their core. Such an object would then um, begin accreting and potentially supplying some luminosity. Now, black hole accretion physics is hard and I'm not an expert, so I recruited five experts on this topic to be co-authors on this paper with me. And we um, look through the literature on different prescriptions of how a, star, how a black hole would accrete a star from within. Doing this 
problem very properly is exceedingly difficult. You need magneto-hydrodynamical simulations with general relativity and radiation transfer. Beyond being difficult to pronounce, it's really difficult to actually calculate. Doing these kinds of calculations on the leading supercomputers today, you couldn't even do a second of evolution. And so we adopted multiple different prescriptions for how uh, such a, a hole could potentially grow and how it might radiate. There's a lot of issues that need to be taken into account here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, at low masses, the, the black hole would grow at the Bondi rate, um, which is proportional with the mass squared. And then it may or may not hit some, something like the Eddington limit, which might cap its growth. And then you may additionally have effects of photon trapping. And so it's not clear if the photons get out and power the star or if they get dragged directly into the hole. And this is the difference between having some feedback with the star and the stellar plasma or the star basically just going dark. So in the interest of time, I'll show you one, one such model. So um, here's a theoretical simulation of our normal sun. This is a Kippenhahn diagram zooming in on the solar structure. So on the y-axis here, you have the mass coordinate of the sun, and on the x-axis, you have the age. So every vertical slice here is a point in time showing you what the sun looks like. And this is just you know, normal, regular science that we actually think is true. Um, and then over here is the same thing, but with the radial coordinates. So these are radial snapshots inside the sun. So the innermost parts of the sun are um, fusing hydrogen into helium. These things are being transported out by radiation. And then the sun has a very thin by mass, but extensive by radius convection zone that's transporting the remaining energy. Eventually, the sun is going to exhaust its hydrogen fuel supply, leaving behind a, an inert helium core. And it will expand into a giant, um, potentially engulfing the Earth. The situation is quite different when you put a black hole inside the sun. Here you have something like the mass of Hyperion at the birth of the sun, and it's growing somewhat slowly over time at this slow Bondi rate. Eventually, um, it hits this kind of critical mass where the, the, uh, it can accrete efficiently. And um, what you can see is that it, it drives a very, very tiny convective core outside of, uh, outside of the black hole uh, boundary. But as the black hole grows, the, this increases the range of influence it has over the star until the point where it shuts off nuclear reactions because the luminosity from the accretion is exceeding the luminosity from nuclear fusion. And the star expands. You can see the star still expands into a giant over here. And here I put um, what the Bondi radius is. So this is the um, inner boundary. So I've, I've modeled this in the Mesa Stellar Evolution Code through a trick introduced by Donald Clayton in which we uh, model the evolution of the inner boundary condition in the star. And that way we can model the response of the stellar plasma to the growing black hole at the core. So what would the luminosity look like as the star grows? Here you have um, the normal sun. So in the past it was dimmer. Right now it's its current luminosity and then it'll expand into a giant and um, destroy the Earth. Over here, you have this uh, Hyperion mass black hole that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and so you have the normal evolution of the sun, but then as the luminosity from the accretion onto the black hole grows, you have the fusion luminosity shut off, and the sun actually dims over a period of something like 50 to 100 mega years in this particular accretion model. And then the accretion onto the black hole takes over, and you grow into a red giant. And the simulation stops here. Um, it's not exactly clear what happens afterwards. Maybe you eject the envelope in a Super Eddington jet, or you just collapse into the black hole. We, we can't model that, so I can only speculate. Um, you notice that we won't, uh, it doesn't expand as much as the normal red giant sun, um, but it would nevertheless boil off Earth's oceans. I'll wrap up very quickly. So here's a, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram showing the evolution of these, these objects. So this is the evolution of the sun, the normal evolution. If you have a, a, a 
I've been calling these Hawking stars in honor of Stephen Hawking. Such a Hawking star would change the evolution where you'd dim, and then you'd go over here to the red of the red giant branch, potentially for billions of years, living in this rarely occupied region of the HR diagram as a red straggler star, which would give you unique astroseismic properties, and therefore potentially enable the discovery of these objects if they are really out there. Finally, I have this diagram showing what stars of different masses and different black hole masses would do in their evolution. So stars of very low mass, any, any kind of star could have a black hole of very low mass, and it would live its normal main sequence lifetime without any change to its evolution because the black hole can't grow efficiently at that, uh, uh, in that regime. This white band tells you when the star would live half its life as normal, but then be changed into one of these Hawking stars uh, halfway through the main sequence. So this gives, a, gives us an indication of what kinds of stars are good probes of what kind of primordial black hole masses. So in conclusion, the Big Bang may have made black holes, and if so, some stars may have captured those black holes during their formation. It's not clear um, whether these, uh, these stars um, are out there or not, but given all of this, I think it makes sense to try to search for them. Thank you. I completely agree with you. Um, so here we've modeled things <laughs> radially symmetrically in a 1D stellar evolution code, making a large number of assumptions about the growth of the black hole and its behavior. And um, I don't have uh, very high confidence in any of the accretion schemes that we've produced. And that's why I've constantly gone back to my black hole accretion experts and asked them um, about these kinds of details. Like for instance, what happens if you power a jet inside the star? What, what happens then? And so that's why this paper became uh, quite long. And in fact, we even split it into two papers and wrote a follow-up uh, specifically on the issue of photon trapping. Um, so I think there's a huge number of theoretical uncertainties here. And I've only shown one possible model in the case of Eddington limited spherical uh, accretion. And um, so I think we do need proper simulations or even just um, thinking hard about these different cases, even without simulating, in order to make real progress on this topic. Um, I don't necessarily think that the case I showed here is the most realistic case. Um, maybe the photon trapping case is um, closer to reality, but even that might not take into account the, exactly the kinds of effects that you've mentioned. So I think we need a lot of theoretical development in this area. Thank you for your great question. Yeah. Uh, I looked at this paper in the archive today. But, well, for those who are unfamiliar with this, so there was a paper saying that the Hawking, the Hawking evaporation can be inefficient and there might be primordial black holes as light as 10 to 10 grams. So what would change globally in your picture? Because those things would be, like, imagine if they exist, they would be way more common, and one might be just sitting inside the sun, and we won't even notice because it's not growing. Absolutely. Right? That's right. So um, based on this diagram, so I, I don't, let's see, that's, uh, that, that would be way to yeah, the left to over the here. 10 to the minus 25 or yeah, so yeah. solar masses. Those would, every star could have one of those without changing the properties. The efficient is extremely inefficient for those low mass black holes. And I think that is um, ir ir irrespective of the accretion scheme. I don't think these low mass black holes suffer from the problems that you've been talking about, for instance. There, there are many of them within the orbit of the Earth around the sun right now. It, 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 but I should say that a caveat to this scenario is that it's all based on a theoretical model by Giad Valley that uh, is only, uh, was only proposed by him the particle physics community, if you ask any particle, theoretical particle physics, is, uh, they will tell you that they don't think it's. Because basically, okay. he suggested that 
uh, based on some general arguments that black holes do not they, uh, lose more than half of their right. mass. Yeah, I've heard him they, talk about that. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a controversial statement. Yeah, it's sure. certainly. So I wouldn't take it too seriously at this point. Okay, I, I, that sounds fair to me. Um, one thing I would add is that this diagram varies the lead a little bit because it only considers the main sequence lifetime. And when a star turns into, for instance, a giant, it has a degenerate core, that drops the opacity and that could potentially um, increase the uh, accretion, uh, accretion rate of these even very small black holes. So even the ones down here, they wouldn't change the main sequence population. But as you evolve into a red giant or a white dwarf, it might be that you then eat up the star very quickly, even with a very low mass. I don't know about 10 to the minus 25, but it's certainly uh, this, this region of the diagram, for a few orders of magnitude, are certainly probed by the post-main sequence population. By the way, the passage of such black holes through the Earth you know, does not produce any even seismic noise. That's right. The only risk is if it goes through your body, then it can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely unlikely. I, uh, I talked to um, Bernard Carr, student, Florian Kunal, and he was imagining the scenario and thinking, I could be so lucky. I think I have the right USB port for the pointer, so I'm just going to gesture. Um, here we go. So, oops. hi everyone. My name is Emiko Gardner. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a second year graduate student at UC Berkeley where I research gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries. Um, I work with Luke Kelly there and have also received a lot of input from other members of Nan Nanograv on this work, especially Andrea Mitridate and Anamal and Lemke. So if you haven't heard, this past summer, pulsar timing arrays announced that we found evidence for a gravitational wave background. This evidence is found in the plot on your left, where we have the correlation in time delays from pairs of pulsar signals as a function of their separation angle. For a gravitational wave background, we predict this very particular correlation pattern shown by the dashed line, and that's known as the Hellings and Downs curve. Our data is in blue, and you can see that it beautifully fits that curve, and we know of nothing else besides a gravitational wave background that should produce that pattern. From the data, we can also ex extract a characteristic strain spectrum where we have the amplitude of our signal at different frequencies given by the violin plots here. Now, Neither of these definitively tell us what the source of that background is, only that there is one. There's two general classes of models for what could be producing that background. The more conventional is that of supermassive black hole binaries. In this scenario, we have black hole binaries at the hearts of merged galaxies all across our universe that each emit continuous waves as they orbit one another. Their superposition should produce a stochastic background. On the other hand, um, and first I'll point out, we were able to reproduce our observed signal by simulating these populations, shown in blue. On the other hand, there's this whole class of models that we lump under the category of new physics, 
It also involves a lot of cosmology, cosmological sources like um, phase transitions, domain walls, cosmic strings, none of which I'm going to discuss today any further except to point out that they can reproduce our data and they tend to predict a purely isotropic gravitational wave background. This is just a symbolic representation of that. On the other hand, in our black hole scenario, we have a gravitational wave sky made up of many individual point sources. If this is true, then we should over time be able to see some areas of the sky looking generally louder than others, inducing anisotropy before hopefully eventually we can resolve individual continuous wave sources. Thus far, most of the analysis from nanohertz gravitational waves has been done using the amplitude and shape of the stochastic gravitational wave background. And people have long assumed that that's all that we can learn. However, I aim to convince you that there's a great deal more information we can learn by looking at continuous waves and anisotropy, and the detections or lack thereof. So that's the focus of my work. Before we move on, let me talk a little bit about the models that we use. We simulate these black hole populations with Holodeck, a coding package developed um, with the lead Luke Kelly and many of us contributing within Nanograv. Um, we start with a population of galaxies from a galaxy stellar mass function, and then we assign some portion of those galaxies as being in pairs or mergers. They, we assign them some merger time and are left with a population of merged galaxies. Then, to assign each merged galaxy a supermassive black hole binary at its center, we use a direct scaling relation between the mass of the host galaxy's bulge and the black hole. Finally, we have to evolve these supermassive black hole pairs in time until they reach separations small enough to emit PTA band frequencies. So that's the nanohertz regime. Finally, we have our population, and we Poisson sample around our expectation values to get some random universe realization. The key part of the code that I work on is extracting these single sources. And so that's what you see in the characteristic strain spectrum here. Each color represents a different random universe. And the circles are our loudest single sources at each frequency, with the sum of all other sources being the line in the background. I'm going to try and play a little audio for you right now. So that's what this plot looks like if you send it to a radio transi transient specialist and ask them to sonify it for you. Shout out Eli Whiston for that. Um, I do scientifically justify playing that audio, not just because it's fun, but because it highlights the fact that if you heard the high note at the end, that was, this, that was this purple point up here. And the point I want to make is that whether you have one of those loud signals rising above the background or not depends a great deal on your random universe realization. Regardless, if we look at ensembles, we can see that varying components of our model has significant impact on whether we're likely to detect a single source. To look at one example, let's consider our parameter for the overall number density of binary galaxies in the universe. This is our galaxy stellar mass function normalization. Throw in the pair fraction and merger time, and you get it generally represents merged galaxies. The key plot on the right here is showing the expectation value for the number of single sources we could detect as a function of increasing binary number density. And somewhat counterintuitively, this is decreasing. That's because as you raise our galaxy stellar mass function normalization, firstly, you from light to dark green, you have a better chance of randomly sampling a very massive, very loud source. However, you also have many more sources contributing to the background as a whole, making it harder for this single source to be distinguishable. This second effect wins out, and we see our likelihood of detection decreasing. Zooming out, we can do a similar analysis for several other components of our model, in green representing the galaxy component. In the orange, this is our black hole bulge mass scaling relation. And then in blue, this is the most exciting area of parameter space where for these are the parameters that describe our binary evolution model. 
And we can see in these small corners of perimeter space areas that predict high detectability for single sources. If it was not clear, we have not yet detected a continuous wave. So we can start to disfavor these regions of parameter space. And this is thrilling news, because this means that gravitational waves, particularly continuous waves, can especially be useful in helping constrain our binary evolution model and answer questions like the final parsec problem. How, does, how do supermassive black holes get close enough to emit gravitational waves in the first place? Another highlight of this research was trying to characterize the properties of the sources we're most likely to be able to detect. So here we have SNR weighted contours of the distance versus the mass of single sources in color and average properties of the background in shades of gray. For each panel, the different shades represent variations on that one component of the model while the rest are kept fixed. The key thing I want to highlight here is that for several components of our model, we see that the variation has very little effect on the typical background properties. However, we can then still have a change in our likely sources to be detected um, for the single sources. So this is really highlighting how we can use continuous wave sources to break degeneracies in our model parameters. Finally, moving on to the anisotropy. So we analyze this similarly to the way cosmologists study the CMB, where they break the map down into spherical harmonics and look at an angular power spectrum. We have these CL terms that represent the amplitude of statistical fluctuations for the ELF mode. And here we have our CL anisotropy term as a function of increasing frequency. The different shades of green are different variations on that same parameter we looked at earlier, the galaxy number density. And you can see that in any case, our anisotropy increases for higher frequencies. This is quite intuitive because at higher frequencies, binaries evolve faster, so we have fewer contributing to the background, while loud sources can still rise above and induce anisotropy. That's similar to what happens when we go from high to low number densities letting us have higher predictions for anisotropy in the light green. The most exciting thing here is then when we look at this purple line, this is the upper limits on anisotropy, our most conservative upper limits, using our current nanograv data. And this is already encroaching, sorry, I'm almost done, all, already encroaching on much of our predictions. So this means one of two things. Either we will detect anisotropy in the very near future, and be able to confirm that these gravitational waves are for, from black holes, not cosmological new physics. Otherwise, if we continue not to detect anisotropy, we can rule out significant regions of parameter space. With that, I'll leave up my conclusions and the one key takeaway that I want you to remember, that by incorporating information from continuous waves and anisotropy, we can make much stronger constraints and break more model degeneracies than possible using the gravitational wave backgrounds alone. Um, we have a paper on this which was just accepted to AppJ, uh, and that is on archive, and I will also be around most of tomorrow and today. If anyone wants to meet, please shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to take any questions. years ago there was a, a, a program that uh, Chang Pei Ma and Caitlin uh, Schutz uh, worked on which was to look at nearby giant black holes and ask uh, what constraints one can put on, on binary companions because we don't see a gravitational wave signal. Um, so in principle one can connect your work with what they, I mean they just put upper limits I guess. And, um, but there are specific black holes within, let's say, 100 megaparsecs that we can, in principle, consider as potential anisot uh, sources of anisot. Yeah, it sounds like what you're talking about is targeted searches, which is there's a lot of people in Anagrav really excited about doing this, where they're going through these lists of these sources, probably like the ones that Chung Pei um, identified, and seeing if we can specifically test for those in our continuous wave detection pipelines. I'm not familiar with if that's been used, um, integrated into our anisotropy searches, but it's definitely in the continuous wave searches. And so far, we haven't had any very thrilling results from that. 
But many people are optimistic that as we get better data, that might be one of the right approaches to search for continuous waves. Okay, yeah, just a question. Uh, apparently, the, uh, the background will depend quite strongly on the, well, presumably, will depend quite strongly on the mass function of the binary. So basically, the mass ratios. Mm -hmm. So like, if there are minor mergers that are uh, predominant, you won't have that much. So uh, how is it taken into account in your models? Yeah, that's a great question. So that goes into our black hole bulge mass relation. Mm -hmm. Here we have mu, which normalizes that, um, that relation. And then epsilon is just a scatter in that relationship. So that would really be defined by mu, which is one of the parameters that we put constraints on using the gravitational wave background so far, and then I'm working on constraining. But other people are working on incorporating other aspects into these host relations, like n sigma relations. Um, and so there is definitely a lot of room to study there, and we've left it as um, considering a pretty wide region of parameter space so far. Yeah. Go ahead, Mahesh. So you mentioned kind of two different things that you can do. One is look for individual objects as you know single continuum, continuous wave mm -hmm. sources. And the other is looking for these CLs, yes. cosmology like just anisotropies. Mm -hmm. Are these really different or are they the same test end of the day? So the methods for searching from them for searching for them are very different yeah. even though their sources are from the same mechanisms. And so it's actually one of the questions I'm most interested in right now is which will detect first. And because the approaches are quite different in our detection pipelines, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. But it's a good question. Unfortunately, there is no binary at the center of our galaxy, because otherwise you could see it. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> so it might put me out of a job. <laughs> Any, yes, please. Um, so you mentioned that the um, anisotropy or the probability that we see single sources depends on the binary evolution model. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, any idea of what parts of the evolution model are most likely to give you more anisotropy or less? Yeah, so um, let me go back to that result. So the way that we have a really good chance of getting single sources is also what gives us high anisotropy if we have long binary lifetimes, that would be the case. Also, if we have especially fast hardening from environmental processes. But I have to provide the caveat that all of these detection statistics assume a, um, they're calibrated to give us a gravitational wave background detection. So if we do have really long hardening times, we wouldn't be that likely to detect the strong gravitational wave background we've seen so far. So, there are strong caveats on what those results will actually be, and that's kind of what I'm working on now by running this through our actual detection pipeline. Yeah, yeah it's not only that, but also if, if you were depleting the binaries very quickly because of gas at the center of galaxy, you would also lose the background. Right. So you can, in principle, constrain both of them, either not bringing the, the two components close, to, close together or actually bringing too fast close together. Yeah. But it's tricky distinguishing which of these, how it's going to affect single sources versus the overall background differently. And so anytime you have these effects being mass dependent is where you can, I think, really break the degeneracy there. OK, if there are no more questions, let's thank the Thank you.
Okay, I think I have everything plugged in. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm a Hubble Fellow here since September, and I'm very happy to talk to you about some recent results uh, in the last six months. Uh, I'm first going to introduce the concept of uh, planetary systems around white dwarfs and what we can learn from X rays. Um, and I hope I'll get to some recent results looking for more of these systems. Um, this is much more uh, terrestrial, well, not quite terrestrial than the talks we've had, but uh, yeah, much closer to home at least. Um, so this is uh, a not very aesthetically pleasing plot, but informative. Um, this is every star that we know of that contains some evidence of exoplanetary material. So here, this is from the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, this is every main sequence star and giant that hosts an exoplanet or more than one exoplanet. This here, uh, so, so this, uh, this is an HR diagram. This here is the white dwarf cooling sequence uh, for every white dwarf that has metal pollution in its atmosphere. Uh, I'm also showing a few white dwarfs that have transits of transiting debris or planets and planet candidates. So I just like this as a summary of exoplanetary system material from the start to the end of a star's life, assuming it evolves into a, a, a white dwarf and not a black hole. So white dwarfs form at the end of stellar evolution for stars less than about 10 solar masses, and that leads to very high surface gravity. Uh, this surface gravity leads to very rapid elemental sedimentation, leaving, in most cases, a pristine hydrogen shell at the surface. In some cases, the hydrogen shell is not there, and we have a helium shell. But, but either way, they should be pristine. Um, that was true until 1917, when a spectrum of Van Manen II was taken. So this is the, the very first evidence of exoplanetary system material. This was a spectrum taken in 1917. At the time, it wasn't even known what white dwarves were. So this was not identified as exoplanetary system. Uh, evidence, but uh, rather an F or K star. But retroactively, it was clear that this, in fact, was a, a white dwarf with heavy absorption associated with calcium, iron, and magnesium. Since then, there have been 23 unique photospheric metals identified in the atmospheres of white dwarfs. Uh, this was a paper from Beth Klein. And I'm just plotting here the date at which, at which each element was discovered. Um, I really like this exponential growth. Uh, and it makes me wonder what will be next. I think there's going to be quite a few things that we can still find. Um, and I've just highlighted some elements that we know we need to form rocky planets and to sustain life as we know it. Um, so white dwarfs are really the unique tool to probe the bulk composition of exoplanetary material. Um, to date, there are almost half a million white dwarf candidates identified in Gaia. Some 40,000 of those have spectroscopic confirmation. Um, if we look at various samples, we find that 25 to 50 percent of white dwarfs have metal pollution. So the presence of this metal pollution is not rare at all. Rather, it's, it's actually really quite common. Um, and these numbers, at least the spectroscopically confirmed ones, are increasing rapidly thanks to the MOS surveys, the multi-object spectroscopic surveys, such as DESI, SDSS-5, Foremost, and maybe Weave at some point. How do you pollute a white dwarf? The model that has become the canonical model is that at the end of stellar evolution, the, the star that's hosting its exoplanetary system um, will lose between 20 and 80% of its mass. This will destabilize orbits and lead to lots of gravitational perturbations. And that can lead to the scattering of asteroids, moons, planets, um, to within the Roche radius of the, of the white dwarf. Uh, when, it, when any of this material reaches the Roche radius, we expect that it will be tidally disrupted and form a disk. We have lots of evidence of these disks from transits, which are variable in time and very uh, heterogeneous transits of lots of different bodies, uh, double-peaked gas emission lines associated with metals. This is the calcium triplet. And infrared spectra. Um, so these are three big key pieces of evidence for the presence of disks. The main piece of evidence for uh, planetary system material in white dwarfs comes from the photosphere of the white dwarf itself with these deep and broad metal absorption lines, which are 
massively broadened by the high pressure at the surface of the white dwarf. Um, all of this is indirect evidence of ongoing accretion. And I will, I will show you the first direct evidence of ongoing accretion, which we recently achieved in X-ray. Um, if you want to back out something about the parent body that got accreted, you want to know about the accretion rate and the elemental sinking time scales. So we can measure abundances using white dwarf atmosphere models, uh, com uh, combine those abundances with white dwarf model parameters such as settling times, like sinking times of each metal, and convection zone mass, and derive an accretion rate which is element specific, but we can then get a total accretion rate and try and understand how much mass has been accreted as a function of time. One key uncertainty there is in the treatment of convection. This is um, a big part of the research that I do is how we treat convection properly in the atmosphere of white dwarfs. And if you get this, I mean, the, the takeaway here is that if you don't do convection in, in more than one dimension, then you don't get convective overshoot. And if you miss convective overshoot, then you get the mass of your convection zone wrong and the sinking time scales. I'm not going to go much into that at this point, other than to say that this leads to a prediction of an increase in the accretion rate onto metal polluted white dwarfs. There are other work, there's other work and other physics which also predicts increases in accretion rate. Actually, the work of Evan Bauer here looked at um, thermohaline mixing as a potential explanation for, uh, well, shows that potentially. Uh, we might expect higher accretion rates than if you do not include thermohaline mixing. All of this to say that we need an independent way to measure the accretion rate onto white dwarfs. And so we targeted G29-38, which is the prototype of all metal polluted white dwarfs. It was the first one to have an infrared excess identified in uh, the 90s. Um, the nice thing about an X-ray detection is that if, you, if, if we can measure an X-ray luminosity, uh, we don't need to couple our measured abundance to white dwarf model uh, parameters. Instead, we, can, uh, we just need the white dwarf mass and radius, which are parameters that are much easier to get from spectroscopy or photometry. Um, so we targeted G29-38 with Chandra. In 105 kilosecond observation, we detected a significant source of soft x-rays at the location of G29-38, which is what I'm showing here. This observation was attempted with XMM. XMM actually would be more sensitive for these soft sources, but you can see there's a bright contaminant very nearby, and that's why we needed the, the angular resolution of Chandra to make this detection. From the measured x-ray flux, uh, we've, we find a, a flux of 10 to the minus 15 and a, a, an X-ray luminosity of 10 to the 25 ergs per second. So I think this is probably the lowest accretion rate measured outside of the solar system. But I'm happy to be corrected on that if, if I'm wrong. We also find a very soft source of X-rays here at 0.5 kilo electron volts. And this allows us to back out an accretion rate from X-ray and compare this to the accretion rate from the, from the atmosphere. So this was published two years ago. And I now want to introduce you to a new uh, candidate system. Uh, since we got the first detection of X-rays from a metal polluted white dwarf, I'm leading a search for more of these things, both targeting known metal polluted white dwarfs and finding white dwarf candidates with adjacent X-ray sources. So this here is an XMM image in uh, 0.5 to 1 kilo electron volt. And we have a coincident X-ray source with, with this white dwarf candidate. The position here is shown in green. This is a three-color JHK image. So this is our white dwarf here in green. This is the XMM source position, and this is the proper motion corrector position of the white dwarf. The X-ray spectrum shows a similarly soft source. We have two components dominated by a component about 0.1 kilo electron volt and one around one kilo electron volt. And from this, we get an X-ray luminosity of uh, 10 to the 20, well, X-ray flux 10 to the minus 15, and X-ray luminosity of 10 to the 27. So at the distance of the white dwarf, this would imply an accretion rate of about 10 to the 11 grams per second. So up until this point, it wasn't known that this was even a, a white dwarf. It was just a candidate in Gaia. We got Keck Elris spectroscopy. Uh, and you might recognize the shape of this spectrum looks very much like Van Manen 2. This is clearly a, a white dwarf with heavy metal pollution. So I'm just indicating a few lines here associated with iron, magnesium, and calcium. Um, the abundances are consistent with bulk Earth. Uh, all of these dots here are uh, 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 meteors, 
meteoric composition. So we have something consistent with some meteor or um, uh, bulk Earth composition. But one quite puzzling thing in this spectrum is that the, the absorption lines are much narrower than the white dwarf model can predict. Uh, this is, there's a limit to how narrow you can get your white dwarf line because your pressure broadened in the, in the atmosphere. So this is either pointing towards uh, different composition at different parts of the surface or some absorption above the, the photosphere, perhaps some circumstellar gas. We took a closer look at the spectra. We got six spectra over two nights separated by six days. And we actually have noticed that there is significant absorption which develops on the second night compared to the first. This is very exciting. This is only the second system that shows this. Um, and we're very excited about this. Unfortunately, we only got two epochs before it's set. But we do have the detection of variability in this spectrum. Um, so I think this could be caused either by um, heterogeneous composition on the surface or by circumstellar gas that has some structure. Um, I just wanted to flag this infrared neighbor, which is a cause of concern when, when we're wondering where these x-rays are coming from. In its JHK colors, this looks somewhat like a, a brown dwarf. So this could be substellar companion. However, it's too faint. So this is most likely to be a background infrared source. Um, it, if it's an M dwarf, there's no way that the X-rays can be coming from the M dwarf, because the bolometric, the LX over L bol would be three orders of magnitude higher than you would expect. Um, and this is just the multi-wavelength summary. I only recently found this H alpha image of the system. I'm not sure if it's detected here or not. So we might have something in the background that's flat infrared to H alpha, but I'm not really sure if this is detected. So this is very much a work in progress. I'd very much welcome your feedback and questions. And uh, thank you for listening. I'll leave my conclusion. I think I was puzzled by is that you mentioned a temperature of order KV, but actually the Vera temperature on the white dwarf is 100 KV, isn't it? Uh, if you take, I mean, the gravitational potential is 10 minus 4. I mean, it's 100 times more than the sun. The sun is 1 KV gravitation. And the white dwarf is 100 times smaller. So it should be 100 KV, not 1 KV, unless you degrade the x rays. Well, I mean, most, most cataclysmic variables, for instance, have spectrum uh, temperatures much lower than 100 kV. Well, so my question is why? Because if you okay. land on the surface of the white dwarf, a proton will give you 100 kV. Yeah, I mean, this, well, this is optically thin emission. So then, if it's optically thin, it's even better. You yeah. can see the 100 kV directly. So if you can find the answer to that, let me know. <laughs> OK, I think, I think John might have the answer. Yeah. If you have a high enough accretion rate to form a shock, yeah. Then you do get temperatures like, you know, uh, 20, 30 kV. Um, but if you just have sort of individual particles coming in, yeah. they share their energy with a lot of particles. Ah, and so you keep the so they cool by sharing the energy. So, ah, okay. so you, you do get enhanced emission, but it's much, much cooler. Because they share it with the surface. Okay, interesting. Ramesh? So I would have thought that this accretion disk would be a pretty short-lived phenomenon. What do you, I mean, must I have an estimate of how long it lives? Yeah, we have really crude estimates for how long these disk, disk lives um, observationally. Um, most studies, of which there are two, and one of them is mine, find that those lifetimes are probably on the order 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 years. Right. Um, but they could be much, much shorter than that. That's what I would have guessed, um, a lot shorter. But so then, you know, are you just lucky to find one or a few, or? Well, the, there are many white dwarfs. I think I have a, I think the, the yeah, this is, this is with some fractions. So that about 2% of white dwarfs have an infrared excess attributed to the disk. So, so I think that, that in itself implies that these lifetimes have to be, have, must be longer. Than or that. they have repeated episodes. Yeah, so I think the, the model that we're imagining is that it's, the, the, the white dwarf doesn't just have one accretion episode in its life. Mm -hmm. You've got probably lots of planetary material if you, if you take the solar system as an analog. And over the 10 giga years of white dwarf cooling that have, has taken place so far, you know, you can keep introducing new material into the Roche radius. So we think it's probably an episodic 
um, event in, in, in most cases. Yeah. Okay, last question. Go ahead. There. This is really fantastic. Thank you. Um, if these metals diffuse a bit into the star, they would increase the mean molecular weight in the outer layers, and that would affect the buoyancy frequency. Do you think it would be possible to see an astro-seismic signature of, of this heavy metal pollution in white dwarfs? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're really talking about trace metals here, so um, we don't... Oh, uh, I didn't think it'd be this far back. Yeah, so, I mean, th this G29-38 is one of the most metal polluted. So we're really talking, this isn't logs, we're really talking sort of t one part in a million. Okay. Um, so I don't think that the quantity of matter is enough to affect really anything to do with the structure or convection, with the except of thermohaline mixing. Which and the other thing to keep in mind is there is the pollution of whatever lands on the surface because of the uh, diffusion in what's in my yeah. So that you lose the materials from the surface. Right? Yeah. This is number fraction though, so you, do, you get like an order of magnitude because these are much heavier than the hydrogen that's around them. So yeah. part in 10 to the 5, maybe yeah. even part in 10 to the 4 mass fraction. I don't know if that's enough to really... That, that might start to make a difference. I think there are some, it might, it might be possible. Okay, let's thank uh, Tim again. Thanks. Testing, can you hear me? I don't think so. No. Testing, okay, good. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Tommy Chiho Lao, I'm visiting from uh, LMU Munich and um, I'm happy to be here to share with uh, my work uh, with Till Brunstil, Joanna Drakowska and St uh, Sebastian Stemmler on the sequential formation of uh, giant planets in a substructure disk. Um, so uh, a little bit of introduction of the current understanding of uh, the theory of planet formation. Uh, so we still see uh, ISM size dust and we also see uh, planets of hundreds of Earth mass. So what's in between is uh, a key question uh, in, uh, in the theory. So uh, usually, uh, in the current understanding, we will split these uh, stages into uh, different steps. So the first one would be uh, just simple coagulation of these dust particles into uh, something up to centimeter to meter size. And uh, the community usually call these uh, objects uh, pebbles. And uh, as we have these pebbles, they, can, they wouldn't be growing continuously through uh, coagulation because uh, of the fragmentation limit that uh, you no longer can grow things. Instead, you're breaking down these particles as you smash them together. And uh, so the next part uh, would be how do we get from these pebbles to platesimals? Um, there's a, um, a, a mechanism called a stream instability, which is some overdensities of these dust filaments that can uh, trigger gravitational instability to form uh, platesimals of uh, up to about a kilometer in size. Uh, and, and, which, and at this point, we will start using uh, masses of these objects to uh, describe them. Uh, and then from platesimals, uh, instead of uh, uh, pairwise collision of these bodies, uh, it has been proved that uh, their process is very efficient because of the gravitational interactions of these uh, uh, almost up to Earth-sized objects would stop growing within the disk lifetime. So uh, instead of considering a pairwise uh, accretion, we consider the accretion of uh, these uh, pebbles, which are still in the disk, 
are on to these platysmos, which has been uh, shown in recent years that to be a very efficient way to form planetary cores that can subsequently uh, undergo uh, gas accretion and also run away gas accretion to form uh, the giant planets that we see. So uh, it looks like uh, we have a rather uh, complete picture of the entire path, but uh, there are actually uh, plenty of problems in the theory. So first, uh, these dust particles inside the, inside the uh, disk, they will actually drift uh, towards the sun within like t uh, tens of thousands of years, which is well below the disk lifetime and also well below uh, uh, the growth timescales of these platysmos, unless we have something to stop them and uh, store them in the disk. And, uh, but uh, if we have found a solution to this problem, it means that uh, platysmos can really uh, create these pebbles in the disk very efficiently. But why it stopped in the copper belt? Because we already see the copper belt is probably very likely to be the direct product of platysmal formation. But why it happens uh, to the planets but not there? Then uh, another question is, uh, in most of the prevailing literature, uh, People will assume there were already uh, seed embryos uh, uh, when they studied plant formation, but it's also a key question that uh, when and where do platysmos form in the disk? Because this is critical to the final architecture of the, uh, of the planetary system you, that you form. And uh, for planetary cores, we also know uh, these effects of uh, plant migration. Uh, this is a very well established way to uh, explain hot Jupiters, which are uh, Jupiters or gas giants, which are formed, uh, which happens to be uh, very close to their host star. But uh, for our own solar system, we don't see that. We have Jupiter F5 AUs, which is uh, very far away from the sun. So we need to explain why um, uh, the Jupiter stays there, but we don't have another uh, hot Jupiters in our own solar system. Uh, and uh, it's also unclear when gas accretion happens in the disk because at least in our own solar system, we see two classes of giant planets. We have the gas giants, we have the ice giants, but uh, in most of the uh, current models, it's quite easy to form uh, in the same system. We have only one type of the giant planets, but uh, it's quite difficult to form uh, both of them in the same system. And also, we have recently uh, observed uh, the PDS-70 system where uh, there were two uh, giant planets at about 100 AUs from the star. So uh, it's quite difficult to explain that because of the time scale problem, because the orbital frequency there is much lower. Uh, it means that to, uh, for all of these uh, planetary groups uh, mechanism to, to operate, there will be a much longer time scale. But we already see them in the planetary disk. So, um, uh, this also poses a challenge to all these theories that how we can uh, form uh, planets there very efficiently as well. So um, and, uh, another motivation of uh, this work is uh, some uh, recent observation. So before ALMA, uh, in our imagination, uh, the protoplanet disk is something very smooth and nice, can be described with a simple equation. But uh, we see actually this substructure is very common. Uh, these are some different rings in the uh, millimeters uh, range. It means that uh, uh, dust are being trapped at this location. And uh, we also see that from the kinematics of the motion of, uh, of the gas, we see that uh, these locations are actually uh, local pressure maxima. And um, also the optical depth of these different rings, they are actually consistent across different systems. And uh, it has been proposed that uh, platysmal formation may be the, uh, may be the mechanism to, uh, to balance uh, the optical depth of these uh, dust rings. And uh, on the theor theoretical point of view, uh, a pressure bump or a local pressure maxima is likely to be a favorable environment because uh, dust is concentrated there. So uh, it is both useful for pla forming platysmos and also for the rapid growth of uh, platysmos. And, um, and on the other hand, uh, planets are also retained from migration at this location because of the change in the slope of the surface density. Uh, so in our work, uh, we try to uh, connect all critical uh, uh, processes together uh, to explain uh, uh, or the, to model uh, formation of pl uh, planetary systems all the way from ISM-sized dust uh, to pebbles, platysmos, planetary cores, and uh, giant planets. And uh, here we assume the substructure in the disk. Uh, it means that uh, we assume an initial pressure bump in the disk. And, um, 
And in this particular work, we coupled the dust and gas evolution code called DustPy, which is developed in the group, and also a parallelized symplectic direct energy code called Simba. Uh, so we need this uh, symplectic and uh, parallelized code to actually model a large population of platessimals. So uh, here are some animations. So initially, uh, we only have a disk with uh, gas and dust, and we introduce a pressure bump at about 5 AUs. Uh, this is entirely arbitrary because we just want to test the idea of uh, the consequence of a pressure bump, and we put it there because we want to form Jupiter. Uh, so initially, very quickly, within 0.5 million years, we already have a concentration of dust at the initial pressure bump. And as the uh, dust surface density has reached the critical value for forming platessimals, we realize uh, we turn a part of these dust uh, uh, into actual embodied particles, and we continue to simulate their uh, evolution in the disk. So at this point, uh, we have already the first ice giant, which is we defined it as anything above 10 Earth mass. Then uh, you can see that the pressure maximum has shifted because of the gap opening by these ice giants, then uh, the pressure maximum is pushed slightly outward. <coughs> then here, runaway gas accretion has occurred for the giant planet, and it opened a deep gap, and uh, planet migration has also stopped for this one. Then here, we have another planetary record that has just become an ice giant at the new pressure bump. And soon we'll be having another gas giant. It has undergone uh, another uh, uh, its own uh, runaway gas accretion phase. So then now the new pressure bump is located at this location. Then after some time, does continue to accumulate here. Then we have another generation of platessimals. And two of them become another pair of ice giants. And now we stop our simulations here because the disk is thinning out at this point. Um, so, um, so, am I just blocking it? Ah. So here's uh, just a cartoon uh, representation of this particular simulation. So we start. Uh, from the initial pressure bump, we see a rapid formation of the, fa uh, of the first gas giant, which is very favorable, uh, particularly towards uh, the cosmos canvas, because we already see a dichotomy in the uh, meteorite record, and uh, we would need uh, Jupiter there to stop uh, the mixing of the two chemical reservoirs. And, uh, and also the pressure bump avoided uh, the uh, migration problem. And uh, we also see the late formation of the ice giant, so that would naturally explain their masses because uh, we need them to be formed late so that uh, by the time that uh, they are formed, there wouldn't be enough gas for them to become another pair of gas giants. And uh, we also see a formation of a compact chain of planets uh, that would be something required in, for example, like the Nice model uh, uh, to explain the architecture of the modern solar system. And, um, and we also see that this substructure can be both the cause and the consequence of uh, planet formation because you see the first one is the, uh, the cause, but the second one is the consequence. And, um, and it seems that a sequential planet formation uh, is a natural outcome that uh, it will just continue its process, continue forming planets until the mass is depleted in the disk. And um, we also show that uh, planetary cores are formed very rapidly in, in the disk with substructure. So it means the core accretion model can work far away in the disk. So for example, in our first work, uh, we already showed that at 100 AU, we can form a planetary core within 0.3 million years. So, so that would be really convenient to explain uh, a far away gas giant. And uh, we also see a pairwise formation of planets. So this means that um, uh, it may be possible to explain something like the PDS-70 system. And also, uh, it happens that uh, these two planets are in one to two resonance, and uh, this matches uh, what we see in, the, in this particular system. Uh, but of course, there are a bunch of outstanding questions, like how the first substructure was formed, and uh, how to form the carbon belts, which is not shown here. 
and how to bring the giants in the modern locations of the solar system. So that will, that will require some uh, form of instability to, um, uh, to like, uh, at least uh, scatter these two ice giants to, to a f much further orbit. And then uh, another natural question would be how to extend this model to the inner solar system because, um, because this would kind of constrain the um, dynamical history of the inner solar system and whether uh, all of these processes would disrupt uh, the formation of the inner solar system. And uh, yeah, so this is pretty much it that I have. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, so actually for these questions, we have kind of have an answer as we continue working on it. So uh, this is like a very good motivation to continue our project. <laughs> Uh, so um, I think for the asteroid belt, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, some model believes that the asteroid belt is a result of a collisional cascade. So but this one, we are not actually doing that. So, yeah. And also the formation history is pretty much, it's quite different. It was another quick, go ahead. Yeah. Would you expect this to be able to um, give ideas about, like if a uh, disk is existing in the environment, which for whatever reason, um, creates more of these overdensities that spawn planet formation. Would you expect this to be able to be used as a tool to direct observations to find um, really significant multiplanetary systems on the order of like six or seven or eight planets just by looking at environments where these pressure densities are formed more often? Uh, I would say that may not happen because if you have multiple substructure, uh, uh, for the inner substructure, you can only get a small fraction of mass in the disk that would not be enough to form your planets. So for example, here is already quite a marginal case. We also we already need the entire outer, uh, the mass from the outer disk to form planets here. So I wouldn't say this uh, multiple uh, planetary system which formed through multiple substructures. It's more likely that you formed one, then you keep migrating them and they get trapped in the, in the disk. We went uh, way over the time limit, so we need to close here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.